my perspective is from ge a geologist and geochemist, so not so much bacteria, but more maybe what's going on in the permafrost. People have talked about the active layer permafrost itself. Um, here's a photo from the high Arctic near Utqiagvik, the northern Alaska coast, and you can see that active layer section there is very peat rich. So kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and so I have it here, sort of the potential role of peat carbon. There's also this transition zone in there um, that that middle arrow points to, which is you can imagine this as Vlad showed. It's the active layer isn't the same uh, depth every year, and so there's an area there that maybe could pond water or microbes or biogeochemical uh, processes or characters. Next slide, please. Um, and should I? Yeah. Oh, oh thanks. And and one way. Oh boy, I'm out of order. I think one way to show this. Oh, sorry. Um, and from an ecosystem perspective, that active layer, here's just a site in Fairbanks where we've got a bunch of uh, kind of different ecotypes. And don't worry so much about the different lines and the craziness, but just kind of look how in some areas where there's maybe wetlands or water or disturbed areas versus tundra versus moss and whatnot, we have a different amount of thaw every year, and that's what we call ecosystem protection. So it's sort of like Mother Nature's uh, lid on the cooler that in a lot of ways is currently frozen. Vlad showed what happens after a fire, you remove this stuff, things can thaw like crazy. But so when people talk about the active layer, realize that where you have wetlands or a mixed forest, you may have deeper seasonal thaw than kind of classic tussock areas. Next slide. Thank you. No worries. So back to this transition zone and whatnot, and this is kind of some neat work on the left that was focused on trace metals. You can see with your eyes, you can map an oxidation reduction front there. So again, all you microbe and bacteria people, I would argue that that's a pretty exciting zone that gets kind of hit every year, freezing and rethawing this oxidation reduction. Um, here's another example of that um, in right near Fairbanks above our permafrost tunnel. Um, same exact thing you see there, not quite as much um, blatant oxidation there, but the, the material on the bottom was, was broken open with a jackhammer and within about an hour it turned orange too. So you, you can visually sort of map oxidation. And one more slide. Uh, maybe there's a couple. So um, Vlad touched on this too, just some of these ideas of, so you can imagine top-down thaw, and that's the active layer and the uh, transition zone and what's going on, and maybe that's a slow thing over time. We also have these sudden sort of thermal karst events. Um, water's oftentimes involved, they oftentimes have gravity associated with them, they're on upland type slopes, or they're flat areas. In this sense, um, an ice wedge has melted out and left a cavity in the ground. These will form over years to decades, and so here's kind of like a, a more dramatic change. Last slide. Thank you. And then just for a little bit of perspective, we operate this permafrost tunnel in Fairbanks, and maybe some of you have been there, but um, we've got a couple hundred meters of excavation in the subsurface. It's great for, here's some of Robin's cores. Um, we've got all sorts of different uh, ice features and whatnot. It's kept frozen all the time. We're about to start digging a bunch more tunnel over the next couple of years. We're going to almost double the size of the facility. Um, it goes from 18,000 to 43,000 years old, the material that's present there, and you can get ice wedges and whatnot. It's pretty easy to work in there, so just kind of a little pitch. We're going to go back further, so we may get into even older permafrost than that 42,000. And if you're interested in working there, let me know. Thank you. That was it for me, and, and hopefully that leads into potential discussions as we move along. Okay. Okay. All right, well, I'm a veterinarian by training, but I have one foot in the wildlife world and one foot in the public health world. Um, I used to think I was a parasitologist, but my very first job with our federal government uh, was in 2005, just as highly pathogenic avian influenza was moving across the world with wild birds. So uh, I became a, a virologist. I think I, I read everything you wrote on flu at that point as a crash course. Uh, so now I think I'm probably more of a microbiologist, working primarily at the One Health interface in the Arctic. And perhaps because I have um, a government background and now I'm back in pure academia, when I'm tasked with looking at something as, uh, as challenging and as high uncertainty about microbial threats from thawing permafrost and glaciers, um, I fall back on, my, on microbial risk assessment approaches because they're very useful in uh, periods where you may not have a lot of knowledge at your fingertips, um, you're at the forefront of a field, so it's, it's a really nice place to start. So I'm just going to follow a little bit of hazard identification, what is there currently in the zoonotic, uh, in the zoonotic pathogen field, and then a little bit about exposure assessment and just what is the probability of survival and exposure. Uh, risk management and communication are also extremely important and any time you're working in the Arctic, uh, I think the communication piece cannot be underestimated. You have to be very careful uh, going back to indigenous peoples and saying, oh, there's these new threats in the environment. I think we have to, um, my time in the trenches with influenza 
has really enforced for me how important that piece is. So what do we know is there currently in the Arctic? Um, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but there is lots to choose from. Uh, there are many bacterial species. There are helminths um, of zoonotic potential. There are protozoans. Uh, we talked about acanthamoeba, um, acanthamoeba earlier, and then viruses as well. So there's a real shopping list of pathogens that we can look at. Uh, that are currently present in the Arctic. And of course, an emerging one are prions, which are a very bizarre pathogen um, and something that uh, has only been recognized in recent years. So in terms of hazard identification, we can identify what's there, uh, but there are many, many gaps in surveillance. So we kind of know what's there, but there's a lot of questions, particularly in wildlife, as to what pathogens are circulating. Even if we know what's there now, what has been there is another big question. And uh, Beringia, which connected uh, the old world and the new world, uh, had a very different fauna uh, in terms of the animals present as well as probably the pathogens and parasites present. So that's another challenge. The other is that the Arctic is not um, cut off from the rest of the world, that every year there is new introductions of new pathogens with the migrations of migratory wildlife. So it's definitely a moving target. And just a reminder that everything is connected by the movements of millions and millions of Arctic nesting wildlife birds. So that's what's there in terms of hazard identification. I guess the next question is what's tough that's there? What's likely to be able to survive for years in, um, in ice environments? And so this is just a list based on general microbiology of what's tough out there. So the spore forming bacteria like anthrax, like clostridium. Uh, the mycobacterium species, there are not only pathogenic ones in the MTB complex, but there's also quite a lot of environmental mycobacteriums. Some protozoans are very, very tough. Ocysts and cysts are meant to survive many, many uh, years in interesting and different soil and, and water conditions. Some helminth eggs as well. Prions, um, although we now know about chronic wasting disease and it has shown up now in Finland and in Norway and is perilously close to our caribou populations in North America, um, there's transmissible forms, but there's also spontaneous forms. So it is possible that over the centuries, um, spontaneous prions have uh, been present in the Arctic that we're not aware of at this time. And then in terms of viruses, tough viruses are our non-enveloped viruses, our naked viruses, as well as some, some of the pox viruses are notably environmentally resistant. Can we rule anything out? Um, this was tough for me because I often am asked to talk about what pathogens are likely to emerge in a climate change future in the Arctic, and so vector-borne diseases are right at the top of my list. But here, they're maybe at the bottom because many of our vector-borne diseases aren't really environmentally resistant and aren't going to survive long in a, in a vector. Obligate intercellular pathogens that are really dependent on host cell architecture, like many viruses, may not be very resistant as well. Um, one exception to that, of course, would be the mycobacterium uh, complex, which are intercellular bacteria, but they are also designed to be tough as well. And then highly host-specific diseases. So diseases that may have evolved um, for which the hosts are no longer present are probably something we can cross off. So just a back of the envelope type list, I, I identified some of the most tough ones that I hear, um, I have to say the bacteria probably win. So anthrax and clostridium are spore formers and mycobacterium. Some of the parasites uh, are very tough as well. Prions can probably live, outlive ice ages, unfortunately. And then a little bit less on our protozoans and even our naked viruses like hepatitis E and our pox viruses are something that may not survive freezing for very long periods. Is it present in the Arctic? Um, we have bison very close to the Canadian Arctic, which are unfortunately a source of not only anthrax, but also MTB and brucella. Um, that were uh, unfortunately introduced from domestic livestock and are now established in wild populations. Chronic wasting disease, not quite there yet, um, but this is where I live. This is the province of Saskatchewan, and you can see in this upper right-hand corner, um, we have chronic wasting disease infected white-tailed deer just at the fringes of our boreal caribou habitat. If it gets into boreal caribou, they could be a bridge to our barren ground caribou, a real issue from a food security perspective. And then finally, this is one of the parasites I work on. It's reservoir and Arctic fox. So anywhere there are Arctic fox, you have Echinococcus multilocularis. And these guys, we do have good empirical data to show that they survive for years in a nice, stable, cold environment. So they like cold, and they are adapted to the north. <coughs> 
So what are our needs in terms of doing an exposure assessment? We need to know the actual microhabitat. So the pathogen eye viewpoint uh, is very different from some of the things that we may measure as, uh, on the geological or physical scale. How likely is it they will survive in terms of environmental stages? And how likely is it that stages will survive that are inside carcasses? And carcasses serve as a cryoprotectant for many things that could prolong survival long past when we would normally expect to see it. In terms of is transmission likely, uh, we need to know how host specific some of these pathogens will be. The transmission routes, something that's inhaled versus ingested is of far more concern. And for many of these pathogens, we still don't even know the minimum infectious dose. So ending with more questions than answers uh, on our gaps, most of the time spans we have in empirical studies looking at survival of pathogens are you know, days, weeks, maybe months, very rarely years, and definitely not centuries and millennia. Uh, most information that we have is honestly how to kill things rather than how to preserve them. So uh, that is a challenge in the literature as well. And then just a reminder that our Arctic adapted strains are often different in terms of their levels of freeze tolerance. And this is Trichinella, a nematode that I work on. I can pull a walrus tongue out of my freezer that's been there for 10 years and get viable larvae out of it. If I did that with the pig form, which is the far more commonly known form of Trichinella, it would be dead. So there are differences in the pathogens that are in the Arctic than the ones that we generally use in labs to determine things like environmental survival. So more questions than answers at this point. And I just wanted to spark a dialogue. I'm sure there'll be lots of controversy over the things I chose to put on that list and the things that I call tough. And happy Thank to discuss it. very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Birgitta, for inviting me last May to join here. We are very happy to attend with Alexandra because we want to make our mostly basic studies, as Warwick know, to more applied science a bit more. So, and we are seeking for input from you, all of you. And let me be very aggressive toward <coughs> invite you to subscribe to our Instagram account in article up Yamal, so where you can nowadays get most recent news about our life. So, there are, you know, three major changes, uh, drivers of change in the Arctic, which is uh, climate change, of course, industrial development, and grazing or trampling. And I bet the Yamal is the best place where you can find all three drivers in a measurable, raise the measurable conditions uh, together in one area. It's not Taimir, it's not Canada probably, it's not Alaska because we have a biggest herd, because we have a, uh, somebody tell us about Sabeta today already and uh, the, the climate change. So another uni uniqueness is geography. We have, you know, the tundra is not all the same. It's different subzones according to CALM team. It's the shrubby tundra zone, typical, high arctic, etc. And you see here in Yamal we have perfectly nicely similar width of the stripes of different subzones. And of course all these drivers I show you in the previous slides will di act differently in these subzones. Another fantastic advantage is the logistic. I know my, my friends work in Canada, in, uh, in, uh, in Greenland, they're all about twin otters, they're all about helicopters, bloody expensive. In Yamal we have very most northern in the world railway, where if you friend of mine, I can stop the train basically in any single kilometer to sample. <laughs> so, because, and you see, for example, here on the map on Sabieta, now we have international airport there with the daily flight with Airbus and Boeings from Moscow, daily. And if, again, if you're a friend of mine and you're mal government, you go there for free. You don't <laughs> And uh, of course, we are, I hope you, you get the point that we are trying to work with the local people, with indigenous people of the territory. And here is a huge problem for, I bet for the majority of you, how we worked before with them. We go to Tantra, we interview them for three hours, we go away. And then we make a report during four years. I study local people, I know from them, this is terrible situation. This is not true, it's, it's a baby children garden story. Nothing with the science. With the science, you should work, you should live one year long with them, day and night. Of course, it's not possible for all of you. We all need to be at the families, otherwise my wife will go away from me, etc. But <laughs> where is the balance? We should think about that. Unfortunately, I know many people all across the Arctic, all across the world, scientists, how you work with local people. You interview them for three hours and you make your profit during the next five years, which is wrong from my point of view. This picture is going to show you that we are a bit different. We're trying to find this balance. 
Next, I want to show you that with the help of Yamal government, absolutely unprecedented even in the world Arctic scale, we have an amazing support by, for example, building for free and equip for free these remote field bases for us, this transect of the base in Yerkuta, in Sabirta, in Bell Island, and close to Labutnangi. Uh, nowadays, we have, for example, in Yerkuta, we have 750 person days this summer with 12 different countries and 32 different people. And I say, you are not allowed to leave the station before you tell me how I should improve my station for better. And, the, and quite many professors, I'm so proud, give up now and say, Sasha, sorry, we do not see the way how better you can do this station. Uh, we are now close to Nikita Zimo station in Chersky <laughs> with the equipment. So. And then uh, to, to underline for you that I love these inputs from many of you. We have way more questions than the answers. So just you remember the transect of the station and the food webs, basic food webs representatives. And you remember these three drivers of change. And you remember these different subzones. And of course, they will act differently. With the less players, more players, I just plane now to and back. You see the connection and the number of species different. Two words about Sabeta. That's an amazing event in the Arctic, I think, in a world scale. Again, try to imagine during centuries, it was a few local people. At the Soviet time, it was a military service, a few dozens of people. And then, boom, next day, 32,000 people appear. A town. We are not the people who is this Greenpeace or WWF, or oil leaking and blah, blah, blah. No, not at all. But we're just interested how the 32,000 people eating and go to toilet every day change the wildlife and terrestrial ecosystems, in particular around. And look what we find, for example, about the Arctic foxes, our flagship species, and EUCN flagship species, of course. So we try to to measure this rodents abundance and the fox abundance and uh, my friends from Canada working with the Gilgatier, etc. So, and we find a fantastic pattern. Oh, finally we get these pictures. So great. They are dynamic and they follow until the year 2017. It doesn't work at all. And then next year it's jumping back. And why this exists? We are sure it's probably because of feeding, extra feeding by people. They survive through winter, etc. But try to imagine if you, I will go back a few slides, how it will change the entire ecosystem again. These food webs, because the waders arrive from other countries. They saw, okay, it will be only two foxes per hectare, but they are not. They are 30 again, in spite of rodent decline. So, a way more questions. And, and now, of course, about migration. We are so interested. So, you, uh, everyone show this. Uh, these maps of the, but now they are not listening to me, the guys who show in the maps, and they still don't pay attention, please. Uh, you, you, you tell me, exactly. <laughs> so you, you show a lot about the migration, and the, and the speaker before show a lot of maps. But try to, you, I just have a very short view on this fantastic garden here. Try to imagine the square, just a few gardens like this size, 20 by 20 square kilometers. And we have these, these birds flying. And this is the particular roots of our group, research group of different species, the peregrine falcons, the long tail skewer, the short tail skewer, and, and the dunlings, and a few more. So when I'm in Russia, I'm always saying, look from which huge part of the work, world we are in Yamal responsible for. But when I am abroad, I say, look which huge part of the world we are from Yamal control. <laughs> so, and that's really a way more questions than you can imagine. We just, it, this is just four species, but we have 80 species. Soon I will show you more in, in the next years, but still, it's, it's absolutely outstanding for me, of course. And this is just about one species, also our project funded by the Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Environmental Agency. Just the peregrine falcons, the same species. The, huh. Another example. Pay attention again to Instagram account, but Jer Falcon. My son name is Sokolov, which means falcon in Russian. Mm -hmm. So the biggest and rarest falcon in the world. They nest on the rocks and trees. And look, this was the original range in Yamal for centuries, for millennia. And then Gazprom appear and build the most northern railroad, I told you. And Jer Falcons in Yamal start to nest there <laughs> under the bridges with uh, 10 trains going over their heads. They doesn't care. And we are people, we spread most rarest and most biggest falcon in the world, food and off. I am sure Gazprom should apply for the license how to breed the most rarest and the biggest falcon <laughs> in, in the world. And 
Until three weeks ago, I congratulate you all here in this room, if you don't read the media yet. Until three weeks ago, all the humans in the world believe there are no walruses in Yamal. Walrus, you know this, 1,000 kilo animal. A few, two, maybe five. My institute complete the red data book two weeks ago. There are no walruses in Yamal. But we go in one of the part of Yamal we find more than 1,000 in one group. And we find the, this year born babies, last year babies, two years ago babies, the very sustainable group, well, group, 1,000 and 1,000 kilo each animals, which of course migrate somewhere with the viruses and of course change locally the ecosystem. And it's again in Yamal, which is one of the most studied part of Arctic in Russia. We hell don't know nearly anything about this tiny area still. And just my last slide to show you, to, to get, you can forget all my slides before. Just please remember this one. This is just a word cloud from the papers we, we published last five years. So we are about Arctic, falcons, tundra, foxes, etc. Thank you and sorry for the time. <laughs>